because uh, God is not limited to our age, <laughs> right? Today, uh, welcome this morning. Um, we're going to be talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm t I titled the teaching uh, today called The Road to Golgotha and Beyond. We know that Golgotha is the, the mount or the hill where Jesus is called the place of the skull is what Golgotha meant. And it was where they took people to be crucified. Okay, but we know that the testimony of Jesus Christ, in a sense, many thought that his walk and his, his testimony, they thought they were stopping it right there when really that's when it really began to, to build momentum and build strength and power. And there were people that came together in such a way. And the Christian movement of the Holy Spirit, if we could call it that, became so powerful that the Roman government eventually ended up stopping through Constantine the persecution of God's people and incorporated them with the Roman Empire because they knew it was so powerful that it may have taken over everything. So everything that God has done, a lot of times we see men try to put their hands on it and put their name on it, put their label on it, put their agenda on it. But praise God that God is sovereign. <laughs> and God takes all that and he turns it around and, and according to his principle and it fulfills prophecy. Amen. So we're going to talk about one of the greatest testimonies of, of the prophets and um, the apostles and all of us who believe the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished at the cross. And we're going to begin in Matthew 27. Verse 11 through 50, and this is where we spoke last week about, about Palm Sunday and how, you know, the triumphant entrance of Jesus coming in to the last week of his physical walk on this earth. And how the people were praising him and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I mean, God has come to save your people, come to, come to redeem your people. And we're going to find that in today's teaching that those same people within a few days were yelling out, crucify him. And we're going to see the greatness of the glory of the mercy of God written and laid out in the scriptures. And so here... Now, it starts in verse 11 of Matthew uh, chapter 27. And he is now at this point, he has come through a bunch of different questioning and things like this to where finally they're like, oh, this guy, we're going to crucify him. <laughs> and he comes before Pontius Pilate. And the religious people in the area are there accusing him of being a heretic. Um, there are many things that, that man said, non-believers said about Jesus Christ um, when he walked the earth. Some of them said, who is this man that, and that's in our midst? Some of them said he had a devil. Some of them said he was a blasphemer. Some of them said, I say that you were the son of God. <laughs> you know? And so, so there's a lot of different, you know, opinions and Everybody has one to a certain degree. You know, a lot of people say, keep your opinion to yourself. No, your opinion matters. What you think of God matters. One way or the other. And so here, Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Now Jesus is responding back. <laughs> they were pretty frustrated before this because he wouldn't say anything back to them. He wouldn't say anything to defend himself. A lot of times when we're going through persecution because of our faith and because of the identity that we walk in as Christians and believers, sometimes we want to defend ourselves. But there's a time and a place for it. Sometimes we just need to be still and know that, that God is God. 
Sometimes we need to let the Lord fight the battle. Slow the anger. <laughs> you know, it's okay. <laughs> you know, and and when you find yourself following the example of Jesus Christ here, you're going to find yourself coming up with a better answer. And a truth that might even bring more persecution, but it's going to set people free in knowing what is true and what is not true. So here Jesus is speaking of a truth, saying, it is as you say. And in verse 12, he says, and while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Interesting how he was talking to the governor, but when it came to the false priesthood, let's call it what it was, and what it is to this day, anything, anyone that doesn't accept that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God is a false prophet. I don't care what other religion you have. This is the Holy Word of God. And here's the Word of God addressing those who thought they knew the Word of God, the Law of Moses, which is also the Word of God given. Okay? And so here he's saying nothing to them as they're accusing him. And in verse 13, it says, Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. You ever had somebody come up to you and just start attacking you verbally? And the quieter you are, the madder they get. This is what was going on here. You know, Jesus was like, he knew he wasn't going to convince them. He, it wasn't his job to convince them at that point. It was his job to bear the cross. And he knew his assignment. See, he had already gone through the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Lord, if this cup can pass me, you know, from me, you know, let it be so, but nevertheless, your will, not my will, but your will be done. So here, the governor was greatly marveled, and in verse 15, it says, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished or desired to be released, and at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? And Barabbas, or Jesus, who was called Christ. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. These were the same multitudes that just one week before were worshiping Jesus as he entered into the city, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When the, the people realized By getting religious leaders and, I mean, think about this. Pontius Pilate, as we go on, he's already being warned by his wife. God went and spoke to his wife in a dream. She was troubled in a dream about Jesus. To spare Pontius Pilate from dirtying his hands with the innocent blood of the Lamb of God. This tells me that there was a chance that God's plan for Pontius Pilate was to be saved. Or why else would he warn him in, through his wife in a dream? Think about that. Because as we go on, you're going to see how he literally washed his hands of it. You don't hear that preached about a lot, do you? So, but you got to read the scripture for what it says, not for what, for what tickles our ears, right? A lot of times we're like, hey, me, but not you. That's not how Jesus was. Jesus said, whoever. And right here, his wife evidently believed that there was something about 
Jesus that was innocent and he was just and that she didn't want her husband or her having anything to do with nailing him to no cross. <clears throat> and so it goes on and says, um, but the chief priests did this and they continued to persuade the multitudes and that they should release Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Same people that were worshiping him, laying their clothes on the floor and the palm, the palms, you know, the, the branches and, and singing his praises. Do you imagine how that made Jesus feel? One day, humanity was acknowledging him as the king of glory and next thing you know, they were saying, crucify him. <laughs> the most treacherous way to die in the Roman Empire. That was a Roman thing. <laughs> they knew how to do it. Very good. And so here in verse 20, 21, the governor answered and said to them, which of these two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus? Jesus, who was called Christ. They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. Isn't that interesting? He says, what evil has he done that you want to crucify him? He knew what the crucifixion was. He knew that was something for very wicked people. And he's like, what evil has he done? And they didn't even emphasize again. They just started crying out louder, crucify him. This is how infallible the prophecy of Messiah is. That God said he would even harden the hearts of his people if needed. Because of their reprobate mind or the blindness of their hearts, he would turn them over to a reprobate mind. This is a great example right here. They started crying out louder to crucify Jesus. If they wouldn't have been so insistent, Pontius Pilate, in a sense, was trying to stop it. But nothing could stop what Jesus was sent to do. Not even Pilate, who was trying to be merciful to him. Because it wasn't for Jesus to be needful to obtain mercy. It was needful for us to obtain mercy at the cross. Praise God. So they said, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult or a riot was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Wow. Even a Roman, probably pagan, non-believer, was more convicted about shedding innocent blood than the quote-unquote chosen people of God. What a sad, sad, shameful representation when you look at that of faith. Hosanna, Hosanna. Oh, by the way, crucify him. <laughs> Come on, make up your mind. <laughs> but thanks be to God that, you know, like I was saying, God knew this was going to take place and it had to take place for us to obtain mercy and to obtain the grace of God that we might become the righteousness of God. And so here... He knew he couldn't persuade him. And all the people answered and said, he said, I don't want anything to do with this innocent man's blood. But, he, but the people said, all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Whoa. They spoke something over their children that their children had nothing to do with at the time. 
Isn't that crazy? These people were vicious, even at, at sacrificing right standing with God over their own children. That is, that, that don't compute to me, <laughs> you know? And so here, it says, Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Wow. You all saw the Passion of the Christ, I'm sure, everybody. The Cat of Nine Tales. There's some scholars that say that Jesus was so disfigured that the reason that they put the, the, the sign Henry, King of the Jews, over it was because you couldn't recognize his face because they pulled his beard. They would pull the beard from the roots and their whole face would swell up. And so you really couldn't tell, you couldn't recognize him. That's how ugly he got. So even what you saw at, on that movie, The Passion, still wasn't to the full extent of how horrible of a death Jesus Christ suffered for us. So here's Pontus, and he says, okay, you guys, do what you're going to do with him. In verse 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him. They ridiculed him. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Serene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross, or to help him carry his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. How horrible. It would have been a mercy kill if they would have just, you know, run him through with the sword. But this is symbolic of how horrible humanity's sin was from the fall of Adam. It wasn't an easy task for Jesus to bear our sins. He was showing us how to endure because he's appointed a cross to all of us too. And so sometimes people are going to want to crucify you for the testimony of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But you know what? You hold on because what, what lies beyond that is the resurrection life. Salvation for the lost. And so here in verse 38 it says, Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him or mocked him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him 
reviled him with the same thing. So they're trying to discredit. And the enemy who left from tempting him in the, at the beginning of his ministry now has come through these people and said, if you're truly the son of God, take yourself on down off the cross. Take your bad self. You know, they were mocking him. They were saying, unless you show us a miraculous thing, we won't believe you. They didn't realize the miracle of salvation. The miracle of the fulfillment of prophecy. See, this was... This wasn't just a nail in, in the hands of Jesus to the cross. This was the nail in the statement of who he is. Because he was sent forth to be crucified. He was sent forth to die for the sins of God's people. And here, these self-righteous, self-commended people were trying in many ways to discredit that. And so we see a great illustration of what we see today now in our media, in our in, in a lot of different um, aspects of life. People are trying to discredit the fact of who Jesus Christ is. But praise God, we know that in the end it says every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. I had a preacher one time tell me, he goes, there's no non-believers in hell. They all know who Jesus is now. <laughs> oh yeah, they know the difference. They know there's a hell, they know there's a difference between the devil and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. They know for eternity and we see it in the testimony of the rich man and, and Lazarus, remember? He's like, hey, send Lazarus to come drop a drop of water. And he says, oh, I can't. There's this great divide. And he said, well, send them to tell my brothers. I have five brothers, so they never have to come here. But he said, I'm sorry. They, they didn't hear the prophets and Moses. They, and they wouldn't believe one even if he rose from the dead and told them. Talking about Jesus. There's a lot of people like that. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, much less that the word of God is true. That's the basis of all the Christian faith. Is a resurrection from the dead. If that, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then our faith is in vain. So here, we've got all these people And they're just in complete denial. And the Sanhedrin the Sanhedrin are here mocking him along with them. So the two robbers they blasphemed against him too. He had told them I'm going to destroy this temple and raise it up in three more days. See, But they were looking at a physical aspect. It had taken a long time for them to build their temple. But he wasn't talking about the temple they built. He was talking about the body his body, he was talking about the temple built without hands of men, but by the very hands of God, the very temple of the Holy Spirit, whom we are. That is our hope in Christ, that someday we'll receive our resurrected bodies and a new name and a new song in the new Jerusalem. So they put this sign over his head saying, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. 
He said, he who destroys the temple and builds it in three days. If he's the king, if he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him. Verse 43 says, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him in the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. So it was like an eclipse in the middle of the day. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, it is finished. And yielded up his spirit. He breathed his last breath on earth. He breathed his last breath on earth so that the breath of life could continue to abide with us through the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Physically, everything that Jesus did is significant. He breathed his last breath here on earth and gave up the ghost so that the breath of life would still be in the atmosphere of all creation on the earth. And that when we come into the newness of life, we could breathe again. We could partake of the divine nature of the Holy Spirit. So here, he said it is finished, and he yielded up his spirit. What was finished? Anybody? His mission. His mission. Yes. The atonement for the sins of the world. Whoever would believe and allow Jesus Christ into their heart and receive him as Lord and Savior, and believe that he rose from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the majesty of God in heaven, that if we would believe that in such a way that it would become our life to be a living testimony of him, we would experience salvation both here and in the life that is to come. A lot of people will say, well, are we saved? Well, I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, I believe that there's a guy named um, uh, Putin also. I believe there's a guy named Joe Biden and a guy named Donald Trump too. I believe there was a great writer by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien. I believe there was a man named Juan Gomez, who was my dad. What is it really to believe in Jesus Christ? For many will come in his name saying, Lord, Lord, in his name, meaning claiming Christian faith. And he said, away from me, you workers of iniquity, I've never known you. For the Bible over and over tells us to put away our sin. Even Mary Magdalene, in the midst of her, of her worst moment, he said, go and sin no more. I don't persecute you, but go and sin no more. Why? Because that's the testimony of our faith. That's a testimony of a, of a life saved. It's a, it's a person who eschews evil and embraces good. It's a person who resists the devil and embraces the cross that Jesus gave us to carry and showed us how to carry it. Jesus showed us the blueprint of the life that he gave us at the cross that we would become the righteousness of God and walk as Christ so walk the earth. You don't get that preached from the pulpit that much because most people want to keep you in your complacency because then you feel good about coming and throwing some money in the plate and continuing in your sin. 
And they pat you on the back and go, oh, we love you, brother. Yeah, that's true. We love you. But you know what? We're here to train you up in righteousness. Not in a form of godliness denying the power thereof. The enemy would love nothing more than that. But that's not what the gospel teaches. We're sinners saved by grace. We're saved from our sin. We're not saved into our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ wash away my sin. And I won't let nobody force me to claim it anymore. It's mine. It's to my account. It's in my history. But as I become a new child of God, guess what? It's a different testimony now. I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Now I have a new life. Do I make mistakes? That's there's a the Bible says that a sin is a sin, right? It also says that there is a sin that is unto death and a sin that is not unto death. Ponder that. There's things in human nature that aren't always holy in other people's eyes, but it's not to spiritual death. And then there's other sins that are. Killing an innocent child is not the same as saying a swear word. It's not. You know how I know? Because not even men will put you to death or in prison over saying a swear word, but they will if you kill an innocent child and you get caught. <laughs> so we need to understand the balance of, of uh, truth. Okay? Because if not, you're just going to play church your whole life and you're going to find yourself possibly in the crowd. He, when he says, you workers of iniquity, I've never known you. Get away from me. I'm sorry, I don't want to teach you that way. And if you don't, if, uh, you know, if you want to be taught that way, well, pray about that. <laughs> because that's not how I read it. And i got to go by how I read it, not by all the theologies that I've heard of all the other people before me um, who tried to implement certain things in the scripture that when the Lord showed me the truth about it, I said, wait a minute. I've been hearing this other story for all this time, but now that I'm searching the scriptures myself and I'm going from the beginning to the end of Genesis to the end of the Revelation, some of those things don't add up. Got to use wisdom, people. Don't take it from me. Read your Bible. Pray to God. He talked to you as much as he talked to Moses on the mountain. <laughs> he talked to you as much as he talked to Elijah or anybody. God is not a respecter of persons. Their testimonies are just awesome. <laughs> and he used them to lead us in faith. Make your testimony that awesome. Look at Esther. Hadassah. Between her and Mordecai, boy, what a story. <laughs> Pretty neat. <laughs> you know, um, it goes on and on over and over in, in, in the scripture. So anyway, um, here we're going to continue. We're going to continue in that they mocked him. He said, it is finished and yielded up his spirit. I'm sorry if I keep you a little bit long today. We're going to take communion for those of you who'd like to today in the remembrance of the, of the cross and the body and the blood. Um, but it goes on in the. Uh, he gave up the spirit in Matthew 27, 51 through 54. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep or died were raised from the dead. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. These are centurion soldiers. These are Roman soldiers, again, showing more faith than the Sanhedrin and the Jews. Ouch! <laughs> they saw what was going on and surely, truly, this was the Son of God. I mean, they saw people rise up from the grave. These people rose up from the grave and went off into the city and started kicking it with probably some of their old family members and friends and stuff, you know? It didn't say how long they were in the grave. Some of them might have just died last week. And all of a sudden, they're going, hey, wait a minute. We just buried you. I said, yeah, well, you know, we believed in Jesus. Remember we told you about Jesus? 
He must have, he must have went to the cross because it said something about the dead in Christ rising first. And here they come. I mean, imagine he got up and said, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Watch this. We're going to go in there and tell them about Jesus. <laughs> you know? I mean, what a testimony to think that when he died, <clears throat> people literally came up out of graves. Wow. I think this is symbolic of, of us dying to our sin and coming alive unto God spiritually as believers. What people had given up on, that there was no life in anymore, all of a sudden had this new life that was just miraculous. Amazing. So here, the guard said, truly, this was the Son of God. And in Matthew 27, 62 through 65, it says, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember when he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days, I'll rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard? Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. I want to emphasize here, they were saying, well, you know, they're going to come and trick us again because they're deceivers just like him. They're going to steal his body away, and they're going to say he rose from the dead. Well, we know that when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't just ascend and not reveal himself, did he? Did he? He, went and he revealed himself to all the people. He didn't play no, no, no tricks. And they were afraid here that all oh, these people are so deceived and deceiving that they're going to steal his body from the tomb and then play it off like he rose from the dead. And so, so they went to the tomb and secured, seal, secured it, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Matthew 28, 1 through 9. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and, in, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Wow. Wow. We could go on and tell about Doubting Thomas and all that other stuff. We could preach about the resurrection for years. We could preach on these scriptures for years without ever touching any other story in the Bible because it all points to this. Okay? And so he revealed to the people and to his disciples whom he is, risen from the dead. The book of the Revelation again tells us that he will reveal in the end of the age who he is. But you see, the book of the Revelation shouldn't be read as what's going to happen in our generation as much as it was given back then for every generation. From John the Revelator to be prepared to warn the churches, to put away false idolatry, to put away um, immoralities, to put away sin from amongst you who become its saints. To be ready for the Lord when he comes for us, whether it's individually or corporately. 
That's what the book of the Revelation is about. Get ready, get ready. You know not when he comes for you, but be ready when he does. In a nutshell, that's the, probably the shortest explanation of the book of the Revelation you'll ever hear in your life. But that's basically what it's telling us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. Uh, after that, in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Matthew 28, see, the testimony of Jesus Christ and the, the chapter that, that finishes the book of Matthew talking about it gives us the great commission to go and testify of what they had seen and known and heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Praise the Lord. He gave us a great commission. And he knew there were some that were struggling with their faith even then. But he told them all, this is the great commission. Go out and make disciples. And after you disciple them and teach them the truth, baptize them, symbolic of the resurrection, life. They lay the old man down in the water, right? And come up a new creation in Christ Jesus. When you baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost, it's when that new creation goes through the process of the fire of heaven, the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. comes and washes you completely from the inside out. And people see the newness of life, the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the atonement for our sins, Lord and the resurrection life that comes. The promise of eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For none cometh unto the Father but through by the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us be led of your Spirit. Let us be filled with your Spirit. And let us share the love of Jesus Christ and the message of salvation to the lost. We glorify your holy name, Father God. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. 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 God bless you, and thank you for coming today as we partake of communion today. Um, let us remember that we are one in Christ. Amen.